What's the first thing pretty much everyone wants to do in the cloud? Create a virtual machine. So in this video, I'm actually gonna walk through a little bit of detail in creating your very first virtual machine in Azure. Okay, so in this video, we're gonna walk through actually just creating a virtual machine. But rather than just hitting all the defaults in the portal, I'm gonna walk through a little bit of detail. We're gonna do some things manually, just so you understand what's actually happening behind the scenes. Now remember, I'm gonna show this in the portal. Ordinarily, we'd use a JSON template or a Terraform in a real production environment for scalability, for a prescriptive way that I can change control. But for now, we'll just use the portal. Now remember, when we create a virtual machine, it lives within a certain region. We deploy it to a region. So we have our Azure subscription, which can deploy things in lots of regions. We're picking a certain region. In our case, we're gonna use South Central US. Now what we're gonna do is everything has to live in a resource group. So we're gonna manually create our resource group. And then we're gonna manually create a virtual network we're going to create a VNet, then we're going to create a subnet. We'll have just like a, a default subnet. What we're also going to do is we're going to put an NSG, a network security group, around that subnet. So we're going to create an NSG to secure at the subnet level. We're going to create a storage account, which we'll do in blue. We create a storage account. We're going to use that for our diagnostics. And once we've done all of those things, we'll actually go ahead and create the virtual machine. Now remember, the resource group is not a boundary of use. I could absolutely have the virtual network in a different resource group. But I've just done it in the same one for cleanliness. We can just delete this whole thing afterwards. So we're going to go ahead and create our virtual machine. Now what that's also going to do is create a disk for the OS, and it's gonna create a network interface card that we're gonna tell it to link into that subnet. At this point though, we can't get to it. So what we're then gonna do is actually create a public IP and link it to the network card. We will then add an exception to the NSG around the subnet to basically allow in RDP traffic just from our machine, not from the whole internet. We're gonna let RDP traffic come in just from our machine. Then we'll show how we can turn that off again when we're done with it. And then finally, we'll actually add another disk while it's up and running for data and attach it. And after all that's finished, we'll go ahead and deallocate it so we stop paying for it. Then we'll actually delete the disk and everything else in the entire resource group if we're completely done. So let's head over and do this stuff. So here we are in the Azure portal. And the first thing I want to do is create that resource group we talked about. Remember, everything has to live in one and only one resource group. So I'm just gonna to go to my resource groups. If you don't see it, go to little hamburger and you'll find resource groups. Or you could just type in resource groups up here and it will find that type of service. I'm gonna hit add to create a new resource group. And I'm just gonna call it rg-vm test. Now you do pick a region I'm not restricted to this region for the resources I create inside it. This is just where the metadata about that resource group is going to live. I'm gonna pick South Central just to make things easy. Now for this, I'm not gonna set any tags, but realize tags are super important normally for tracking resources, for maybe seeing billing information, etc. So I'll just go ahead and create that resource group. The validation has passed. So I'll hit create. Now that's finished, we can go to the resource group. 
It would also be listed under all the resource groups. And obviously right now I've got nothing inside it. But from here you could see, well, I could grant certain Azure AD groups or users the various roles. Maybe I could make them a contributor to the resource group. So they could pretty much do anything in this resource group except change the ACLs at the resource group level. I can also do things like assign policies. Two of the big reasons we like resource groups to group things together. But for right now, I'm just gonna go ahead and the first thing we'll do is actually create a virtual network. So in my resource group, I'm hitting add and we'll search and I'll just type in virtual network. And here you can see it. We'll hit create. Now, as I mentioned, you don't have to do all of this individually. I could just create a VM and it would do a lot of these things for me. But it's nice to kind of see those building blocks behind the scenes. It selected the resource group for us automatically as we hit add from within the resource group. I then give it a name. So I'm going to call this VNet South Central US 1. Again, you should have a naming standard, use a consistent pattern. Now my region, the VNet has to be in the same region as where I want to create the virtual machine. So again, that's gonna be South Central US. Then we get to pick what IP address space we want to use for this virtual network. By default, it's using 10.1 slash 16. Now, if I don't want to use that space, I can delete that IP space and pick my own. Maybe I'm gonna do 172.16.0.0. And again, I can do that as a slash 16. I'll take that entire range. I could also add an IPv6 address range and I have to add a subnet. Now there was a subnet there already in that 10 dot because I deleted that IP space, I also lost my default subnet. So I'm gonna add a subnet. You can call it anything you want. Maybe I'll call this my infra subnet. And for my IP address range, it has to be within that range of the virtual network. So I might pick 172.16.0.0 slash 24. So I'm taking a subset of that address space and hit add. I'm not gonna set anything like um, distributed denial of service protection or firewall at this point. You get a basic distributed denial of service anyway. Standard gives me more visibility, more tweaks to that behavior. Again, I'm not gonna set any tags, but they're super useful to do. Validation has passed and I'll hit create. So I'm creating that virtual network within that resource group. That's now completed. So I can go to that resource. And again, you can always jump back. If I look at my resource group, you'll see the things that I've created inside it. So if I hit refresh. It's gonna wait a little while to catch up, but in there I've got that virtual network. And there we go. So one of the things I definitely want to have on this is my network security group. So I'm gonna go into my subnet, select my subnet, and from here we see I don't have a network security group. So I'm gonna say, hey, I actually want one of those. Now I do have existing ones, but what we'll quickly do is we'll actually go back out of this and we're gonna create ourselves a network security group that we're gonna to apply to that subnet. And for now, we'll just leave it as the default rules. Now, again, I'm gonna create it in South Central, the same region as my actual resource group and all the virtual machines. There we go. And I'm just gonna call it NSG South Central US test. And again, we'll hit create. So that completed, 
if we go to the resource, it's created inbound and outbound security rules. And what we can see is anything within the virtual network to the virtual network, i.e. the known connected IP space allows, anything from the Azure load balancer, it allows, everything else is denied. In terms of going outbound, well, anything from the virtual network can go to the virtual network. Anything can go to the internet. It is stateful, so the response will be allowed back. Everything else is denied. So pretty much nothing can actually come in to that virtual network. So that's the default rule we have. Now what we wanna do is actually use this on our subnet. So we go back to our resource group. We can see our virtual network. We'll go to our subnet. And now we're just gonna to say to use our nice new NSG. And we'll hit save. So now we've put that set of protections around anything we put inside that subnet. The next thing we want to create is a storage account for our diagnostics. So once again, we'll hit add, we'll hit storage account, hit create. Now we have to use lowercase letters for a storage account. So I'll call it storage account, South Central US VM Diag for my VM diagnostics. Once again, gonna create it in South Central US. You just want standard. The storage V2 is perfect for what we're doing here. I don't need it geo-redundant. So geo-redundant is where I would have three copies in my local region and three copies in the paired DR region. Well, I don't need that for diagnostic data. It will actually cost me more money so I'll just pick locally redundant storage. And my default tier will be hot. So with hot, I pay a bit more money for the storage, a bit less for the transactions, but it's data I'm constantly interacting with, which for the diagnostics, I will be. We could tie in to something called private endpoints, which we're not gonna cover in this. I can pick if I require secure transfer to communicate. So that's on by default. Again, we have tagging and I'll go ahead and hit create. So we're just using this for diagnostic data into a blob container. This will also give us queues, tables, and SMB file shares via the Azure file service. But now we've got that diagnostic account ready for our various logs from the virtual machine. So that is completed. Again, we can go to the resource and we'll see all the different types of service available, blobs, files, tables, and queues. So at this point, we'll actually go and create the virtual machine. Again, this takes a little while to catch up, but there's a storage account in here as well. So now it's shown up. What I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna type virtual machines. We don't have any, we'll hit add. Could have hit also create virtual machine. The resource group. We're gonna scroll down until we see our resource group that we want. So that's our RG VM test. And then a virtual machine name. So you want this fairly descriptive. Again, for me, I'm just gonna call this VM test one. I need it to be in the same region as my virtual network. So I wanna connect it to that virtual network. So it's gonna be South Central US. I'm not gonna pick availability sets. I'm not gonna add other VMs that work together that I want distributed over different racks. If the um, region supported availability zones, I'd have the option to pick that as well, but I don't need any of those things. I'm not using VM spot instances, i.e. a cheaper VM when that spare compute's available. For the size of the virtual machine, pick something that makes sense. For now, sure, the D to SV3 is fine. Now notice for the image it selected Linux. I'm gonna go ahead and change this to a Windows Server 2019. I have to give it a username for the local admin account. For now, I'm just gonna do local admin and I have to give it a password of at least 12 characters. We have to type that in twice. So we've set that local password. 
Now by default, it's gonna enable RDP from the internet. That's because, hey, I'm creating it from the portal. Um, you're probably gonna to wanna to connect to it. So I'm gonna give it a public IP. We're gonna say none for now. We're gonna come back and add this afterwards. This was a test account and I have a license, i.e. MSDN, or my organization has hybrid use benefit. I could say, yes, I already have a Windows Server license. I confirm that I'm telling the truth and I would get it for cheaper. I don't pay for the renting of the Windows license in addition to the compute of the virtual machine. Now for the disks, I can pick the type of disk. If it was testing, I could just do like a standard SSD or even standard hard disk drive. If it's production, you probably want the premium SSD for the higher performance and the kind of provisioned IOPS and throughput. By default, it's a platform managed key. I can change it to customer managed if I want to control that key. And I can add additional disks. Again, I'm not gonna do that right now. Notice by default, it's using managed disks. I'm not using ephemeral, I get stored in the cache of the local machine. So for right now, I just have a premium SSD for the OS disk. Now for the networking, I'm gonna connect it to that existing virtual network we already created. So it can see it. If we look in our VNet, SCUS1, so it selected that. It selected the first available subnet. By default, it's giving it a public IP. For now, we're gonna say no, do not give it a public IP. Most of your VMs do not want public IPs. Um, if you do wanna offer something to the internet, you're probably gonna use a load balancer and a load balancer will have a public IP. I'm also not going to have an NSG on the NIC. Notice it's detected that, hey, look, the subnet has already got an NSG on it. We don't recommend you have a NSG on the NIC and the subnet. It gets very hard to manage. So we did it at the subnet level, so we do not want it on the NIC. If the VM supported it, you would do accelerated networking it bypasses the switch and just gives you extra performance. And I don't need to use a load balancer. For the management, notice we can hook in to things like Azure Security Center, which I've already got protection for. We have our boot diagnostics, so I can see like a screenshot of the actual console. I could turn on guest diagnostics and we pick where we're gonna save this to. So again, it's detected that, hey, look, in this resource group, you have a storage account. Let's use that instead of creating our own. And then there are various other options, things like auto shutdown, very useful to save you money. At a certain time every day, just shut down the virtual machine. Take note of the time zone, make sure that's correct for when you work. I can turn on automatic backup. I can add extensions. So extensions give me other types of functionality. For example, a really useful one I'd probably always want to do at minimum is gonna be anti-malware. So if I select that, I'll hit create. I can exclude certain things when it's gonna perform certain scans. And I'm done. I've now added that. I can add things like custom script extension, uh, join a domain. There are many others available. I'm not using dedicated host. I don't want to use a proximity placement group. For the VM generation, leave this as Gen 1. Gen 2 is a UEFI based instead of the BIOS basis of the Gen 1. But for right now, we can just stick with Gen 1. Again, tags, super useful. This is where I could do things like cost center. I could do owner, date of creation. You should use these in the organization for tracking, for finding resources. So you really wanna fill those in. And then I'm just reviewing all my options. Notice this download a template. If I select this, it will actually show me the ARM template that it would use to create this virtual machine. So this is actually a really useful thing. You could download this, save it for later. But I'll close that for right now. And I'll just hit create. So it's gonna go off and create that virtual machine for me. And that's gonna bake in the oven for probably about five minutes. So that's completed. 
And what we'll actually do is we could go to the resource, but I'm actually just gonna jump straight back over, go back to our home, go and look at our resource group. We can see all the things it created. So we're expecting a virtual machine and there it is. But it also created the network interface for the virtual machine and the OS disk. So they're the resources. So if we now select the virtual machine, that's great. There's no public IP. It got the first usable private IP from the subnet. Remember, the first IP is the network address. And then the next three are all taken by Azure. So in this case, four is the first available IP. But there is no public IP. So if I was to hit connect, what do we think would happen? So it'll download an RDP file for us. We'll try and connect with the private IP and it would fail. That virtual network is an isolation boundary. Well, there's no way for me to connect. I'm not on that virtual network. If I had a point to site VPN to it, a site to site VPN to it, express route, or if I deployed the Azure Bastion service, I could connect. But I don't have any of that. So right now I have no way to get to that virtual machine. So what we'll actually do is we'll go ahead and add that public IP. So we'll create a public IP address. We have to create it in the same region as the virtual machine. So it's just an IPv4. We just need a basic SKU. We'll call it pub IP South Central US VM1. It can be dynamic. Um, I don't really care if it changes for this test. It's gonna get a DNS label name that has to be unique. So this could be SavTech South Central US VM1 pub. It's gonna create it in my subscription, in my resource group, in South Central US. So it's now gonna go ahead and create me that public IP. Now, once again, it's gonna go ahead and deploy it into my resource group. So that's done. If we go to it, there's the DNS name, and I'm gonna copy that just so I can track that behind the scenes and use it again a little bit later on. So now we need to associate it with the IP configuration of our virtual machine. So we'll go to our resource group. Now at this point, I could go to the virtual machine and then go to the NIC, or I could actually just go to the NIC directly. But we'll go to the VM. We're going to look at our networking. We can see our IP configuration. So we'll pick our network interface. I can see my IP configurations. We'll select our first IP configuration. Then we can see there's no public IP. So we'll select enabled and we can pick that public IP we created and we'll hit save. So at this point, it has a public IP address. So should we now be able to connect to that virtual machine? Well, we can certainly try it. So let's just let this finish doing those updates to the IP stack and then we can try that RDP. So that change has been made. Now we'll go back to our virtual machine again. Go to my overview and I'll hit connect. It's gonna use that DNS name of the associated public IP. I can download the file. So it's creating an RDP file for me. I'll open it up. I'll use remote desktop connection. And let's connect. And it's gonna fail. Why is it failing? Well, remember, we have the NSG. The NSG is blocking anything inbound unless it's already on the virtual network. Well, I'm not on the virtual network. So we need to update our NSG. Now you'll notice on the networking tab, it actually shows me the inbound port rules that's attached to the subnet, i.e. my NSG SEUS test, and I can add a new rule. Now, I don't want to just open it up from the internet. 
if I can help it. Unless it's just test. So technically, I guess I could, but I'm still going to get attacked and hacked. So if we add an inbound port rule, instead of doing source service tag, where I could say internet, I only want to allow it from a particular IP address, i.e. mine. So what I can do, if I jump over for a second, I can say, what is my IP? So this is my public facing IP address. That's where request to the internet will be seen to be coming from. That's my NAT service. So what we'll do is we'll take what is my outbound facing IP address and we'll allow that. And my destination, well, it would just be that particular virtual machine. So that was 172.16.0.4. And we're going to use 3389, which is RDP. And the action is going to be allow. My priority for this, I don't want to make it um, too low because it might want to do things in front of it in the future. So I'm just going to say, it's going to give me a list of what the valid ones are. I can go sort of 100, 200, 300. I'm just going to say 1,000 for this one. So we'll set my priority to be 1,000. And my name will be RDP VM test 1. And we'll hit add. So it's adding that new rule. So if I go and actually look at that NSG again in detail, look at my inbound rules, you can see all of the default ones. And now there's, hey, look, allow from this source only to my 172.16.0.4. Again, let's just check that. If we look at my networking on this virtual machine, so that's my resource group, look at my virtual machine, networking, my IP address 172.16.0.4. I'm not saying the public IP. That's kind of invisible. It's just redirecting. I have to enable it to the internal IP address. Now let's try that RDP again. So we'll connect. I could use the existing RDP file. Probably should if I wasn't being lazy. Download. There's the file. Connect. And this time it works. I can go ahead and use that account I created. Trust that cert. But I'm now connected to my virtual machine. So we created a VM. We put a network security group on the subnet. We added an exception just for us. Now, if I'm sitting in Starbucks, if I'm sitting at work, remember that public IP address is not unique to me. It's anyone that's going through the same network address translation service, probably anyone in Starbucks, um, anyone at my office. But I have better locked it down than just anyone on the internet. Now within that virtual machine, we have the operating system, we have the various time zone, this UTC, if I actually go ahead and look at my storage, we'll see, remember, I have my OS disk, my C drive, and then the temporary disk. This is local storage on the node that happens to be running my virtual machine. I never, ever, ever put anything on here I care about. It has a data loss warning file. I don't put stuff here, you're gonna lose it. It does put the page file there. So if I look at hidden items and also Let's look at the options for a second. If we say we want to see the system, we go high protected. Then we can see the page file as well. So that's what it is using it for for Windows. It's putting the page file on there. But essentially, I have those two disks. Now, if I minimize this for a second, I can absolutely add other things to it. So if I go look at my resource group again, I could add a new managed disk. So if I just search for disk, managed disk, I'll create a new one, create it in my resource group. I'm gonna call it VM test one data one. 
I have to create it in the same region as my VM. There's no source, it's just gonna be blank. What size do I want it to be? It can be super small. I'll create it really small because I'm cheap. Encryption can just be encryption at rest using platform managed. Again, I have my tag options, review, and I'll create it. That's creating me that new managed disk. While that's completing, we'll jump back again. There it is. So we'll go back to my resource group. Again, things take a second to show up here, but it would show up here eventually. I'll go and look at my virtual machine. Remember it's running. So while it's running, I'm gonna add a data disk. Now again, I could have kind of created it from here. But notice there's a disk already that I've already created. So I'm gonna go ahead and add that and hit save. And then if I jump back to the virtual machine, so I'm inside the guest. If I start up disk manager, I'm old fashioned, there's other ways to do this, but it's detected the new disk. So I'll initialize it GPT. From here, I'll create a volume. I'll just call it data. Make sure you always do a fast format. And now I have a data drive. And there we go. So that's where I actually put data. I never put things on the D drive. That's a bad day, that's temporary. But now I've added a data disk to it and I'm good to go. So that was creating a virtual machine. Now, you would do other things. You would install applications and everything else. You might add services that have ports that you'd offer on the public, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if I was to shut this down, remember I don't stop paying for it. Just shutting it side, it guessed, doesn't actually deallocate it from the fabric. If I actually wanna stop paying for it, I have to shut it down from the fabric itself. There's also something else I want to demonstrate. So I'm actually gonna disconnect. When you're not using it, so you're not using this virtual machine, Remember, you can always go back into that network security group we created, inbound rule. I can look at, this is me, remember, and I could deny, essentially locking myself out of it again. And I could come back and allow it when I want to connect. This is essentially what the just-in-time feature of the Azure Security Center is doing. It detects your public IP, it adds a rule, it disables it after a certain amount of time. So now if I went back to my downloads, there's my RDP file, and we try and connect again. And they do actually take a while to take effect. So let's see if it's actually, I was too quick. This may let me in. Yep, still let me in. All right, let's give it a second. Let's make sure my change took effect. So there's my rule. And it's now denied. Tick, tick, tick. Let's try now. And the same thing happens when you enable it. It normally takes 30 seconds. Let's try and connect again. Okay, so now you can see it's failing. So now I've blocked my access to it again. So if I wanted to connect, I'd have to go back into the NSG, enable the rule, wait 30 seconds, then I can connect. Again, a better way is to use the Azure Security Center just in time protection that does all of this for me, or set up a point to site, a site to site express route, or I can use the Azure Bastion service. Important point though, I finished using it. Now we did set up that automatic shutdown rule. So it's gonna turn itself off anyway. But if I know I'm kind of done with it right now, just shutting it down from within the guest would not be good enough. I have to hit stop from the fabric. If I hit stop from now, it's actually gonna deallocate it. 
because I did a dynamic public IP, it's telling me, hey, you're gonna lose this IP. It's gonna change when you start it again. Do you wanna reserve it? No, I really don't care. So it's actually gonna go ahead, deallocate, I, I stop paying for the virtual machine. Now, even when it's deallocated, I'm still gonna be paying for the storage, that data disk I created and the OS disk. So if I've completely finished, I've done my test, I don't want this anymore, make sure you remember to go ahead and delete the disks, delete the network interfaces, delete the public IP, maybe even the storage account if you don't need it for other virtual machines. Also by keeping it in a resource group, if I know I'm completely done, well, I can just delete the resource group and it will delete all of those things. So that was kind of a fairly detailed look at creating a virtual machine in Azure. So I hope that was useful. Hope it made a bit of sense to actually go through step by step and manually do a lot of the things that would have kind of just happened behind the scenes, but we wouldn't have really understood what happened and why it was happening. So until next time, please like, please subscribe, please share, please comment. Um, I'll see you soon. Take care.